Well, thank you very much indeed, um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be in Estonia. This is my first time as, as well, and uh, my wife and I are having a wonderful time, and we very much hope that we'll be able to uh, revisit um, uh, your really wonderful country. Um, it's also particularly a pleasure because coming from Ireland, um, there are so many resonances between the um, Irish uh, approach to things and the Estonian that um, I've, I've felt right at home. And thank you also to Laurie for chairing us. What I'm going to do is to answer his deceptively uh, simple question, um, what is, is human dignity? But I want to start um, by um, initially just setting out what I plan to do. And I'm going to do five things, I think. The, the first is to try to give a very quick overview of international human rights law, and in particular, the place of human dignity in that, then related to conflict situations, come to the issue of conflicting approaches to human dignity, um, and end with issues about its implementation. So let me start with the, the most simple idea of uh, international law. And I'll start with the idea that it begins, uh, at least to some extent, with states. Um, so we are in still uh, um, a Westphalian context. Um, by the way, may I, uh, I hope without um, being uh, unduly enthusiastic, say that um, I appreciated uh, your president's speech um, this morning immensely. Um, and essentially what I'll be doing is dropping a few footnotes uh, to his, uh, his presentation. So let's start with some states. So states essentially agree um, through treaties and custom to be bound by certain aspects of international law. Um, I come to the issue of custom because the emphasis is often given in discussions simply to treaties, and we need also to complicate the situation a little. Custom meaning, in part, how states behave, um, as well as what they formally agree to in treaties. So in international law context, we have a variety of different values that are incorporated. Um, ranging from sovereign equality of states through security, sustainability, justice, peace, self-determination, all the kinds of values that you would expect to see incorporated in international law. But within those, and as well as those values, there is the value of dignity. And Laurie's question essentially is, what does that mean and what is its place? So the problem we then come to is that there are different parts of international law. Um, and the one that we're particularly concerned with is human rights law. But it's embedded in a whole range of other approaches and other elements of international law. It doesn't stand alone. Within human rights law, we also have a considerable variety of different ways of implementing it. So we have international, uh, the High Commissioner for, Refu uh, for Human Rights, Human Rights Council being among the two that we could point to. Within the regional context, we've got the European Convention on Human Rights, the OSCE, and then we've got national as well as that. So what are the characteristics, therefore, of an international law system? Well, uh, it's somewhat problematic. There's no clear hierarchy of values apparent within the system. There's lots of them. There's no overall mechanism of coordination. Um, it's ultimately based on the consent of states, and international law is only one mechanism for the promotion of those values. So what are the challenges? Well, again, they're quite considerable, and they emerge out of some of those features that I've just mentioned. So, for example, some may say, and we've seen this, I, I give an example in the context of ISIS, a rejection essentially of the system of international law as a whole. And we can see rejections of international law in the context of, say, the notion that religion trumps everything, or on the basis that realpolitik governs and that international law is simply a, um, a burden, or on the basis of rule skepticism. So some will say international law is so ineffective that we needn't bother with it. So that's one possible challenge. Second possible challenge is 
particularly for those who are concerned with dignity or with human rights, a reordering of the priority of values within international law. So, for example, we saw a range of different values that are embedded in the international law system, and some, therefore, will say, well, now we should be emphasizing sovereign equality of states rather than dignity. So there's a question about the priority of values in international law. Third, there's the possibility, and to some extent we see now the reality, of a fragmentation of values between different parts of the system. So given the multiplicity of different systems, different elements within international law, trade law, international law of the sea, human rights law, we see that different institutions get to interpret each part of the system, and they may do it differently. So when the WTO interprets human rights con concepts, it may not necessarily be the same result that you get when a human rights court interprets it. So too we see fragmentation within the human rights system, with different institutions interpreting human rights differently. So for example, the um, Human Rights Commission, Committee at the UN may interpret the notion of freedom of religion somewhat differently than the European Court of Human Rights does. And then we have weak enforcement and ineffective sanctions for breach. So what then is the place of human dignity? Well, I come to the President's speech, and um, my answer briefly to Laurie's question is essentially that dignity means that each human person, I, I say person, so it's an individualized idea, simply by virtue of being a human person, possesses an intrinsic worth that should be respected. Now, if we can agree to that, we can agree to quite a lot. So I don't want to be thought to be saying that this is not an important agreed upon idea. I think it is. So we want to distinguish that notion of dignity from dignity in some other uses. So for example, in the human rights context, we're talking about human dignity. In other contexts, older contexts, we sometimes use dignity meaning an insult or an honor or respect for office. That's not what it the role it plays in international human rights law. It's respect for the person. It's also different from dignity in other contexts, like the dignity of states, or the dignity of nations, or the dignity, begging your pardon, the dignity of ambassadors, or the dignity of the nation. Those are di that's a different idea. We're coming to the simple idea of each human person, by virtue of their humanity, has an intrinsic worth. So human dignity in that sense, I'm suggesting, is the general justifying aim of the human rights system. And we have various examples in various contexts where that is reiterated time after time. I've given one example of the European Court of Human Rights, but there are many others. So is that relevant in concrete cases? Well, you bet. It's absolutely relevant in particular contexts. So it not only is a general justifying aim for the system as a whole, it also underpins particular human rights. And for example, in the European Convention on Human Rights context, it underpins in particular prohibition of torture, prohibition of slavery, right to family and private life, and the right to non-discrimination. There is an issue, however, in the context of this being an individualized concept. And so the question, for example, is, does it underpin notions of self-determination of peoples? And that becomes more complicated. So, for example, we will be hearing this afternoon about the rights of indigenous peoples. And dignity is used in that context, but it's a somewhat interesting and potentially problematic notion because it seems to refer to the rights of groups rather than to the rights of individuals. So we may come back to that. So is it relevant in conflict situations? Yes. Northern Ireland, Chechnya, the Kurds, Turkey, the war on terror, in international humanitarian law. In all of these contexts, we see human dignity being regarded as a particularly important element where there is a conflict situation arises. So does it go out the window when we have a conflict? No, it rather comes back to be even more important, to be even more central to the notion of the control of states and the control of others in those kind of contexts. 
Are there differences, cultural differences, between states on the notion of dignity? And we come again to one of the themes that the president had outlined in his speech. So, for example, there is a recent Russian initiative in the Human Rights Council at the UN, where the Human Rights Council has now passed a resolution. And the important point is that the resolution has been passed in the Human Rights Council, entitled Promoting Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms Through a Better Understanding of Traditional Values of Humankind, which essentially attempts to have the notion of traditional values accepted into human rights law. But it, interestingly, it does that in the context of a reinterpretation of some of these fundamental principles, like dignity. So essentially, we have what's going on at the moment is a fundamental debate, a th fundamental conflict, we might say, over exactly those fundamental concepts, like dignity. Implementation. Implementation is, of all of the elements in international human rights law, probably the weakest. Let's take two examples to lead into the rest of the discussion. Ukraine. Questions about access to the aircraft crash site. The Ukrainian foreign minister frames it in terms of human dignity. Syria. The use of chemical weapons against civilians. Again, President Obama formulates it in terms of the right to human dignity. He says this attack, the use, of the use of chemical weapons against civilians, is an assault on human dignity. So what we have is a core notion which is under debate as to its meaning, but as not as to its centrality in human rights law. What we have, however, is a problematic element in terms of its implementation in these contexts. And I'll come back Finally, to Nancy Soderberg, whom some of you in this room may well know, um, who is uh, an important an American uh, in foreign policy context. And what she says is the tragedy of Syria, and we could go on and explain it in other contexts as well, is that the concept of human dignity is central, but its implementation indeed is a consistent problem. And she ends by saying the people of Syria are paying the price for this inaction. Uh, we could say that in many other contexts as well. Thank you for listening. I look forward to a uh, lively discussion. <laughs>